Hello, this is Dalton coming to you from the Skeleton Crew editing room. And I just want to begin this video by saying that your questions were simply too powerful. As you noticed from our first release where we discuss the formation of the channel, our 5,000 subscriber Q&A was simply too long <laughs> to release in one video, let alone to record in one session. So we've already released part one, which discusses the formation of the Skeleton Crew channel, and you can find that video linked in the description. Welcome now to part two. In this part of the video, we're going to be discussing the questions that relate to more things about the history of the Skeleton Crew, as well as the interests of the crewmates. And we're also going to be discussing questions related to career and education advice. Now, I want to give a, a preface, and we discuss this when we get to that point too, we address all the questions that we were asked with regards to career advice, but we also feel like it's prudent to say that we're going to be releasing a separate video later on describing, in general, most of our career advice for people who are looking to get into paleontology. We get asked about this a lot, and we want to be able to give you a good answer that'll uh, give you some good tips if this is a direction you want to go in. So, with that, get ready for part two of the 5,000 subscriber Q&A. You're going to be, as always, hearing from Dr. James Napoli, a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, Amelia Zietlow, a PhD candidate at the Richard Gilder Graduate School at the American Museum of Natural History, Scott Johnston, the fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, Alexander Rubenstahl, insert a quip here, PhD candidate at Yale University, and myself, Dalton Meyer, also a PhD candidate at Yale University. Of course, together, we are the Skeleton Crew. And remember, if you like our videos, please do like the video on YouTube, leave a comment in the comment section. We love reading them, we love responding to them, and uh, share it widely. And subscribe and hit that bell so you're notified when new videos come out. Additionally, as a reminder, we now have a Patreon. You can see the details for that in the description below. And we'll be elaborating on that and thanking our patrons at the end of the video. So without further ado, please enjoy part two of our 5,000 subscriber Q&A special. Okay, I'm going to go with this one here, which is completely unrelated to anything at all. I don't know how this username is supposed to be pronounced, but the question is, what is each of our favorite flavors of ice cream? Good question. Which, which yeah, is a great question. Um, all right, so I guess I can, I can answer this one first, and so... I will use it to plug my favorite local place back home. Um, so it's not actually ice cream, technically, if you want to be oh, pedantic about it. I know. Scandal. Scandal. It's I will. Um, there's a frozen custard place back home in, in Milwaukee called Cops, and they do flavors of the day. And the flavors of the day. Called Cops? K O P P S. It's a last name. Perfect. Okay. 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 Cool. Okay. <laughs> bad boys. Bad so we boys. so we went to the police station and they gave us ice cream. <laughs> no. Okay. Any civilization, a hundred miles of, inland is a mistake. It's the last name of a family. K O P P S. Cops. It's great. Um, I don't know how many of our viewers are from the area, but it's better than Leon's. Like you're wrong. Accept it. Um. So, anyways. Thank you, Leon's. I no. exactly. Leon's you heard is here, like Leon. blind, but anyways. Um. Oh, cops my homies does, hate Leon's. They, they do these really, really creative, incredible flavors of the day, like tiramisu, key lime pie, like incredible out of this world. So like if I, here's the problem is if I had to buckle down and pick a favorite, I couldn't. Um, my favorite one that I'm thinking about right now is a banana walnut chocolate chunk. So it's banana frozen custard with walnuts and chocolate chunks in it. And it kicks ass. It's so good. That and like the tiramisu one is so unbelievable. Good. So good. I like chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Thank God. Classic. Black right, cherry. Black cherry. Yeah. That's a that's a good one, Dalton. It is. Um, I'm I'm so torn. I like it oscillates between strawberry, especially if it's got chunks of strawberries in it. Like that's oh, yeah. supreme. Or like um, sometimes you get like a fried ice cream kind of thing, mm. or like a, an equivalent thing where it's like cinnamon swirl with vanilla. Like um, either of those, and I, I truly couldn't pick. Between it's them. hard to have a bad ice cream, but I, I think I'd have to defer. I'm a chocolate person through and through, and the only ice cream that even approaches chocolate ice cream is coffee ice cream. Uh, those are both top tier to be enjoyed in a pointed cone. 
uh, with absolutely no sprinkles or fixing. Hmm. You see, That's I do I my childhood favorite that I gravitate towards when I'm sad is um, I would I used to really like like a soft serve chocolate ice cream covered in chocolate sprinkles in a cone. Oh, those are great. But I don't like sprinkles on hard. Like sprinkles are only on soft ice cream. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, I like them on soft. I don't like them on on. Yeah, ice soft serves a different. It's a different beast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, question, my favorite, either. I guess, individual flavor would be the chocolate fudge brownie Ben and Jerry's thing. Like that, since I was a kid, was always just that was my go to ice cream if I was going to have it in the house. Mm-hmm. But, you know. Black cherry, that's a good one too, Scott. That is good. Have you ever yeah. had the, um, there's like a brand that was used to only be in Texas and now it's nationwide. Um, Blue Bell, Blue Bonnet. Blue Bunny? Blue Bun. I don't think Blue Bunny. I think it's Blue, Bunny blue, blue I think it's Blue Bonnet. I think so. They've got an excellent black cherry. I'll have to keep an eye out for it. Texas yeah. blue blue bonnet is a flower. That's I believe their state flower. It's blue bell. So that would make sense. Blue bell. Oh, blue bell. Well, then it's not. Yeah, okay. it would make sense to be blue bonnet. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> they said no. We're gonna have a bell. Oh my You're god. Gonna like really, it. Yeah. There are these like shaved frozen ices in New Jersey that also kick ass, but I don't consider those ice cream. No. No, that's an ice. Yeah. I, I will also just very quickly say, Alex, you said it's hard to have a bad flavor of ice cream. I had a friend once tell me that they experienced one of the worst flavors of ice cream imaginable, that someone appar- that one of the ice cream places in New York uh, made a promotional ice cream for the movie Glass Onion, and it was onion-flavored ice cream, oh. and it was apparently Okay, well, that's like a freak to thing to do. Of the <laughs> canonical and biblical flavors, you can't have a bad one. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, shall we go on? Next yeah. Game, Dalton, yeah. Wow, the time delta between Scott. answering a question about how we met and what's our favorite flavor of ice cream is just <laughs> immaculate. Who would have known? Um, it's yeah, wild. Um, well, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a large time delta again because I'm going with uh, Cad Mc, uh, McKellen four four six's question, which is, um, how did you all get into paleontology, and is mm. there any advice? to give an aspiring paleontologist, but we'll get to the advice later on there. there yeah. We have a whole section for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep this. We're going to keep this to a, a, a crisp. We're going to be crisp and concise in our answers. So oh, yes. to start off with the king of conciseness, James, <laughs> <laughs> I can do it occasionally. Um, Let's see. I've always been interested in paleontology. I liked it from the time I was a little, little kid. Um, I think I've told the story in some other videos, but my mom used to do like little flashcard things with me in the mornings. Um, when I was a little kid, there was some sort of educational enrichment thing. And um, one morning it was dinosaur flashcards and I kept like gesturing that I wanted her to show me them again and again. And that was kind of it for me. I don't remember that. So I don't really remember how it happened, but loving paleontology and being really interested in it has been just a guiding principle of my life ever since I was a kid. It, it's what motivated me to learn about all forms of science because I wanted to know everything I could while I was trying to go into paleontology. And so that wasn't just about animals, but it was about the earth and weather and climate and you know everything. Even through college, everything I took, I would try to conceptualize in that way. So for me, I got into paleontology just by volunteering in paleo labs and then you know kind of following that path. But my initial exposure to it was really, really early in childhood. Tight, solid, Scott, right. Amelia, Amelia. Amelia. Yeah. Oh. Um, so for me, like I've always like we've we've made jokes about I didn't grow up being a paleo dork per se, but like I've always loved dinosaurs. <laughs> and like the the actual joke here is that when it came time that I actually decided that this is what I was going to pursue, like my family was like, yeah, no. Sh- like, of course, that's what you're going to do. <laughs> like, it was kind it was kind of funny and a little insulting because I'm like, I didn't want to do this. But like the part of that was like, I'd never actually done it before because, <laughs> you know, what? when do you actually do paleo research for real? Um, but anyway, so like growing up for me, I think it was honestly probably like just exposure to more like fantasy movies than anything. Like, I, I think like my I like dragons growing up. I was one of those. Um, and like the closest real thing to dragons is dinosaurs and other prehistoric critters. Um, so I think that was kind of how I got into it. My first like exposure, I suppose, was probably Fantasia, which I think I've said before. So there's the it's the, the original Fantasia, uh, the sequence for uh, the Rite of Spring, 
is the the dinosaur sequence and i loved fantasia um so that was probably it if it wasn't that it was definitely going to the milwaukee public museum on monday free days it used to be nowadays it's not monday anymore but it used to be every monday they were free to milwaukee county residents and we would go there whenever my parents had off work um and yeah no i it's it's got a wonderful like uh paleo evolving planet type uh exhibit fun fact the evolving planet exhibit of the field museum is somewhat based on the third planet i think it's called uh exhibit at the milwaukee public museum where it's like walking you through geologic time basically and ending with uh modern dioramas of the rainforest and there's this big diorama of a t-rex hunched over a triceratops that has like its guts spilled out and everything and it's there's thunder and lightning and all kinds of fun sounds and things. It's just so cool. And I remember, I think I've told this story before as well, but I remember once it was during kindergarten, we went there for a field trip and we were in like our little chaperone groups, you know, as they did. And we were, we were going through third planet, but then we cut through, there's a shortcut you can take that avoids the T-Rex room. And we took that shortcut. I was like, wait a minute, why are we not going in the T-Rex room? And my chaperone, I believe it was either the teacher or one of the other parents was like, well, some of the kids are afraid of the dinosaur. And I'm like five years old and like myself, so cynical and mean. I was like, what, why? It's not real. Do these kids not know this is a model? Like, what the hell? It's cool. Um, so alas, that day I did not see the T-Rex and I was very upset about it. And I remember it to this day. Um, but I think that's that's where it started. But like growing up watching documentaries on Animal Planet and stuff, like even like regular science, I was like, how are these people dedicating their whole life to a single animal? This is absurd. I could never do that. I could never travel to these locations that I'd never been before. I don't want to dig in the dirt, you know, in a hot desert in the in 100 degrees and bearing, you know, sun bearing down on me. And I don't know what happened um, along the way. I guess I decided I wanted to do other things because growing up with the background that I have, my parents are like, that's cool, but you should get a job that makes money, which is fair. That's OK advice. It's reasonable. So I decided I'd be a pilot. It's actually very good advice. It's, it's incredibly very good, good advice. advice. Like, let me be clear. I'm not mad great. about it. It is reasonable advice. Like they were like, you can like hobbies are good, but you need to have a living. And like, cool, that's fine. I like airplanes too. It's my other hobby. So I was going to do that. The problem is airplane school is expensive and I couldn't afford that. So I was like, all right, I'll do something. I'll do something easy, which is a business degree and a business degree will get me a job and I can pay for flight school and go on about my way. So I found this school because I didn't want to leave home, really. I found this school nearby. It was an hour drive called Carthage. And lo and behold, they had this thing where you could go out to Montana for two weeks and dig up dinosaurs. And I'm like, now that sounds cool. That sounds like a fun elective for me to do something to experience while I'm in college and learning and stuff. And then I get there and it turns out business, business is boring. And paleo is very cool and Montana and the field is great. I don't care that it's a hundred degrees. It's so much fun. Um, and then I, at some point I was taking, I think I was taking the comparative anatomy class or I was gearing up to take it. So I was talking with my then advisor, uh, professor Carr about it. And it was really like, at, at one point he just kind of flat out told me, he's like, if you want a career in this field, you can have it. Like you can do it. You just need to decide that you will. And like, that was it. I was like, all right, son of a bitch. This sounds really cool. <laughs> Might as well, you know. I, like James, uh, got interested in dinosaurs at a very, very young age. Uh, I was around two when uh, my dad took me to uh, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh because we were actually, well, we were in town Great for it for a very sad reason. It was uh, my mom's mother was uh in the hospital uh on in her last days and she was like hey can i have some time with my mom and get the toddler out of here for just a little bit and my dad was like yeah sure and took me to the museum little did he know um what chaos he had wrought um but yeah he took me to the museum and it just blew my little two-year-old brain and then ever <laughs> since then um i just in love with everything prehistoric and like everybody else watch watch all the documentaries and tv shows and all that stuff growing up got a bunch of toys still have all those toys my parents are forbidden from throwing them out or giving them away and uh 
Uh, but I would really say I got into the field when I started volunteering at uh, the University of Michigan's uh, Museum of Paleontology's Fossil Prep Lab. Uh, fossil prep lab. Um, that uh, My dad worked at the University of Michigan. He happened to know uh, Bill Sanders, the head preparator there, and knew that a lot of prep labs run off of volunteer work and was just like, oh, hey, my son likes all this dinosaur stuff. He's doing nothing in the summers. Can he come work here? I mean, he was like, "Yeah, he's 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 fourteen. He hasn't even started high school yet. Is there is there a, a lower limit on when he could start working here?" And they were like, eh, "I guess not." And so I started, <laughs> and um, yeah, and then uh, I, I found out actually when I was at my like going away party for when I got the AMNH job that my dad was convinced that I would last two weeks. That um, he's like, <laughs> oh, he'll find out it's not like Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, like everything's all exciting and adrenaline rush and traveling to crazy locations all the time to do the coolest things. It's a lot of really, 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 really dull, very time consuming. I don't want to use the word tedious. Um, Amy, Amy Davidson would always hit me whenever I said the word tedious. So, um, work that it, it's just a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, so it has now been over half my life. I have now spent more of my life in fossil prep labs than I've spent out of it. And yeah, but uh, that's how I got into paleontology. All right, my turn. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> In 1996, I was discovered in a chrysalis in a storm drain. Uh, <laughs> when I was eventually kind of sloughed out in red fluid, I didn't have any fingers or a nose or eyes or ears. But in a period of about seven days, I matured into exactly what I look like now, and I've been like this for about 26 years. <laughs> Kidding. Um, I took the wink like fucking Lucille Bluth. Uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, my parents, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I've always been deeply interested. So there was, when I became interested in dinosaurs, was associated with, my mother worked in, a, in Manhattan in the textile industry. She'd bring me to work with her and we'd go to the American Museum of Natural History often for lunch and then walk around. And that was probably the key moment. And then walking with dinosaurs and also like many others have said, there's, there's a lot of similarity to these stories. So I'm not going to fixate, um, because no one's story is unique. Everyone is the same and none of us are special. Remember that kids, but you know, toys, love my T-Rex, love, you know, plastic dinosaurs, tons of fun. Uh, parents were very supportive. And when I think I actually became aware that it could be more like a, a career, cause I saw documentaries and stuff like that. But my parents brought me to the Bruce museum, which is a small museum uh, in the town I grew up in. And Mark Norell was giving a talk about Mongolian bird lion dinosaurs and I saw that I'm like this is the coolest thing ever and this is what I want to do and then I just hyper focused and fixated on that there were you know I was kind of there were periods where I'm like oh I kind of like living reptiles more oh I kind of like you know the ocean a bit and then no that all sloughed off the sides like the outer layer of my skin uh, when I emerged from the chrysalis that is pretty much it i mean i volunteered like i got in i started by i volunteered at the peabody um quite a bit and my senior year i volunteered at the am and h but like as just like a dude with one of the vests that like answers questions and i had a really fun time um and then once i got to my undergrad uh then i just basically latched onto a lab and was like give me something to do and that was that's the trajectory and it all ends in the grave there you go. Dalton. We'll all on meet that, in the belly of the worm. On that light note. So, yeah, I, I mean, Alex is right. Like, it's not unique. My story is, is basically the same. Um, if you watched the Jurassic Park video, you'll kind of know it. And if you didn't, you should watch it because it's a good one. And I'm proud of it. Um, but I don't recall ever not being interested in paleontology. I've been interested in it as long as I can remember. I, re I remember distinctly even in first grade, there was like a thing. It was like, write what you want to be when you grow up. And you're like, I want to be a paleontologist. Um, and that hung on the ceiling. Um, and 
I don't, I again don't remember if it's because I watched Jurassic Park or if we watched Jurassic Park because I was interested in dinosaurs, but it was all around that same time that this all happened. Um, and I was very fortunate to grow up with parents, I say parents, but I was very fortunate that my mom, um, uh, dedicated viewers will know I'm not dissing my father. I simply don't have one. Um, <laughs> no, and I'm also not immaculately conceived. <laughs> don't don't yes, use the second coming. No, I'm I'm not, not, look at him. Family. Look at him. He looks like Jesus <laughs> if he were a paleontologist. Um, no, my mom and the rest of my family were all very supportive of my interests. And so because they like they knew I was interested in paleontology, like I always got dinosaur books and toys and we bought documentaries on VHS and the closest local museum was the Denver Museum, which was just under an hour away. So we did go there quite a bit um, to see the dinosaurs. And like, I just maintained that interest all throughout my education. Um, again, it, it, as, as anyone's life goes, there were times where I was like, oh, maybe I actually, there were two things that like the two strongest non-paleo desires of what I wanted to do were either being a marine biologist, which I think is fairly common for paleontologists, just because it's a similar aspect of studying cool animals that involves some degree of exploration. Um, and it, it it sits on like the knife edge of mystery. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like complete unknown in the same way paleontology does. Yeah. There was another um, in high school. I briefly was like, oh, I think I want to be an epidemiologist or like work at the CDC or something. Um, but that did not, I didn't maintain that interest for a, a long period of time. Um, I didn't have great opportunities to like volunteer at any museum because again i was like an hour away or so from the closest museum which is a bit long to commute as a child who is just going to volunteer but i did do a summer internship with the denver museum in high school um which i was able to do because it was paid uh, and so i could pay for the gas to drive back and forth um which was a, a great fun that to me I, I knew i was interested in paleontology but doing this program the uh, the teen science scholars they call it um that's what made me realize, oh, not only am I interested in this, but I like doing it. Like, I like going out and doing field work. I like being in this environment and being around this, these kind of people. Um, and I was like, oh, I actually, like, not only did I think I want to do this, I actually do want to do this. Um, and then I went to college and I initially went to Montana State University because they have an undergrad track in paleo. Um, and for various reasons, uh, financial being a uh, pretty strong one. I transferred to Colorado State University to do in-state uh, undergrad, and I, I just geared myself to do a double major in geo and, and zoology um, to try and prepare myself as best I could, and then just went straight to, to grad school from undergrad, um, trying to kind of scrape. I, I did another internship in Badlands National Park, which was another great uh, opportunity, but just trying to get as much exposure to the field as I can, as I could, without having like a dedicated um, kind of way to do it. Um, and now here I am today. So that's kind of, that's my story. Right. A good my, one. A common factor in this, and, and I'll plug something that my advisor has said in the past, and it's certainly not 100% true. You can't make like truisms about people, right? But in general, um, there are some occupations and some kind of things that people, some careers that you develop an interest later in life. And you're like, like, like a doctor, like, oh, like, and you're, you're a teenager, like, I think I want to be a doctor, or I want to, to go into stocks. Um, but people who are like, of the kind of ilk of being a naturalist, which paleontology, I think falls under, it's an archaic, more archaic term, but like, naturalists are born, like, it's something that like, most people who do this field, I think you'll find when you talk to them, like, oh, yeah, I've been interested in this, like, all my life. And even if, like, you know, there's been a long period of time where you didn't do anything with it, like, like Amelia was saying, if, if you go into it, people are like, yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Right. No, because, like, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's been such a. You're Sorry, trying. Amelia, you go. Delay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, and yeah, it's like, and if you talk to enough people in this field, you will find those other interests. Like, you'll yeah. find them, like, they're, they'll tend to be like, really good at another thing that's like a naturalist kind of thing like in like for my own case like i'm really good at keeping animals and plants like i have things around like it just it all makes sense you talk to more paleontologists they're all the same way they have plants or they have animals or they just they have an interest in things like i don't know speaking like to talk about about car again for a hot minute one of the things that he's told me like in montana that he wants to do is he just wants to go out there one time and not look at bones he wants to like Apparently, on the way to one of our sites, there are these red tiger beetles, and he's obsessed with them. He's like, I want to just sit 
in the grass and watch the red tiger beetles and write about them. And it's completely unrelated to anything at all, but just like this desire to just participate with other living things in some way. So our next question, um, this is from Pterosaurs Are Cool. And he, uh, Pterosaurs, he, she, or they ask, uh, what are the five fossils on the logo and what connection do they have with each member? So my skull on the logo is Gorgosaurus. And uh, that's my skull because I really like Gorgosaurus. It is not a dinosaur I've ever done a particular amount of work on. I've just always kind of thought it was really pretty and aesthetic. Um, coincidentally, I now work on Tyrannosaurus, but I'm not working on Gorgosaurus in particular. I just like it a lot. So my critter is Tylosaurus. Um, it's, I don't know, it's it's the animal I have spent the most time on. It is like a child to me. I love it so much. Um, I wrote my undergrad thesis on it. I'm, right, I'm involved in a lot of projects with it right now. Um, I I love it dearly. And so that is why it is my, my critter. Uh, mine is Basilosaurus because uh, it was one of the first major prep projects I really helped on when I was first starting off in fossil prep. They have an absolutely gorgeous one that's hanging up in the uh, Michigan Museum that I helped um, cast like roughly half of. And I'm very proud of it. And I also wanted something that wasn't a reptile on there because all of the rest of you chose reptiles. And I wanted at least one thing that showed that we reptiles covered things cool, that weren't just Scott. reptiles. We also don't cover things that aren't reptiles on this channel. <laughs> this is the reptile. All right. Part. Good answer, Scott. Proud of you. Uh, mine is, uh, my skull is Jungersuka slona, an extinct crocodile morph, and not a dromaeosaur, as a few people have suggested, though I would forgive you for thinking so. And I picked it because it was my first monograph. Uh, it was my master's thesis. I wrote a big, ch chunky paper about it, and I learned all the basic skills I have for paleo during that experience, so it's very dear to me. Indeed. And my critter is Eichstenosaurus, which is a lizard from the late Jurassic Solnhofen of Germany. So that's the same kind of formation, although it's actually several different lithographic limestones, but that's neither here nor there. It's the same essential place and formation that you get Archaeopteryx from. So it's these beautiful limestones that preserve a lagoon and you get lots of really well-preserved fossils. I study lizards and I am in the process of working on a project that includes Eichstedisaurus. And also it has a really nice silhouette. It's one of the, the more nice and complete Mesozoic lizards that we have. And so I chose that for my critter. Oscar Swinburne basically asked the same question. Yes. And just to make sure that we're complete, I think now we should read um, their question, um, which is, may I ask why you chose those specific skulls for your logo? And then they elaborate. I get Karoo as it was named by two of you. And I believe one of you studied Globidans, but why the other ones? And... <laughs> Oscar Swinburne, I regret to inform you that neither <laughs> neither Kuru nor Globidens are on the logo. Um, we, but, but we did just... It's understandable why you'd make the confusion. I actually suspect that um, Junger Sukas is what they mistook for Kuru. Probably. Oh, yeah. yeah that, that's I, could, I could see it. Well. Yeah. Um, but, which is neat. We'll talk more about Sphenosukians in another video. But we hope that answers your question. Um, I'm sorry that... Uh, well, anyway, I'm sorry that we got to another question before yours. But, you know, we get a lot of similar ones. Thank you for asking. Yes, yeah. indeed. Next. So my question, my question, the next question we're going to uh, look at is from Jay uh, Brotsis1, who asked three questions, um, but handily, their first question is, how do we all know each other? And meet, we've answered that already. So I refer you to the previous part of the video, but thank you for asking that question. Refer you to the question, first hour of the video. Yes. The second question, which we'll, we're going to go in order, and we're just going to go pop, 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 pop quickly. Uh, what is your favorite extinct species post the dinosaur extinction? So post uh, the end of Cretaceous extinction. Um, what's your favorite prehistoric animal that lived in the Cenozoic? Mm -hmm. James, go. Um, it would be uh, Panthera atrox, the American lion. I think that the name is wonderful for a like a lion that's like 25% bigger than normal African lion. They're huge. They're, they're, huge, they're really cool. And they've got interesting ecological implications, and I really like them. So, Panthera atrox. Cool. Amelia? I really dig hyenodons. Like, they're big, scary things with big, scary teeth. 
and I am a sucker for anything that looks like a hyena because I love hyenas. Also cool. Tight. Um, I'll probably say I'll probably say Basilosaurus. I I think that whale evolution is just cool as hell. Um, and uh, Basilosaurus is uh, advanced enough of a whale that it isn't one of the like weird, horrifying like like otters that got caught in a taffy stretcher and tried to do an impression <laughs> of a crocodile, like some of the early ones. But uh, it, it's it's a beautiful, incredibly interesting animal. That's a that's really quite a that's quite a description. Sorry, I got stall left on that. Um, <laughs> mine are this this is not particularly creative, but I like the really big Cenozoic uh, Ziphosuchians. <laughs> so you know things like a uh, essentially your your <sighs> sunburns so bad your your Cenozoic crocodilomorph survivors and also terror birds because they're basically just theropods. Yeah, they are cool. And it's it's cheap, but they are really cool. I, I guess I'll just tack on real quick. My honorable mention is Calicotheres. Oh, I cool. just think that they're that's just a great one. So cool. Yeah. No, they're they're one of my honorable mentions. Hyenodon's an honorable mention because I've prepped one. That's like one of my more. I have limited prep experience. One of the things I worked on was a hyenodon. Uh, but uh, to to perhaps be even like more obvious than even Alex's terrors. My favorite Cenozoic animal is is Carcharocles megalodon, and I'm putting my foot down on the genus. I prefer Carcharocles for various reasons, um, and I don't care that it maybe seems overhyped. It is a giant shark that ate whales. There's probably never been a cooler animal on this earth, um, and that's that's what it is. Based. See, I thought you were going to be stereotypical and say like Megalania or something because you're like, oh, lizards. I, mean, I like lizards, but <laughs> it's a giant shark, man. I thought you might yeah. say mastodon or mammoths because you worked on the excavation. They're elephants. I can see those at a zoo. I can imagine. <laughs> There's a third part to this one. As, as paleontologists gaining your PhD, Scott, you're also included as a paleontologist not gaining your PhD. Thank you. Uh, what is the ultimate goal or legacy you want to leave behind in your career? A huge influence of mine when I was really gearing up to enter the field of paleontology was Bob Bakker. I read The Dinosaur Heresies and it changed my life. Just seeing what somebody kind of taking on I, I guess traditional orthodoxy in a field could do when they were armed with a broad knowledge of animals and biology that kind of cross different traditional disciplinary boundaries to address a single important question. And the hope I've always had in my career is that I'll be able to do something of anything that could even be said in the same sentence as that. Um, I like to think a lot of my work in progress will, but that remains to be seen. But that it's just always been to just be able to stand on that in that sort of a realm of scientists to change things, I guess. For me, I think it was like, I know like I'll, for, for a lot of these questions, I'll keep coming back to, to my advisor, Dr. Carr at, at Carthage. Like it was something he said to me at one, during one of our meetings when I was first kind of figuring out what I wanted to do at all was like the way he kind of phrased like the work that we do, the research that we do into these things that have been dead forever is like, you are the first person to understand this animal the way that they understood themselves in 80 million years, 70 million years, whatever it was. Like, we're, you know, literally just getting a window into the past to an extent that's just kind of unfathomable, really. Um, and that that's really what, what matters to me. Like, I do, I really like the animals that I work on, and I really like sharing it with people and getting them excited about these animals that I care so much about. So like doing outreach and just having an impression on people, introducing to the, them to an animal that they may, might not have known anything about prior to that and kind of helping them to see animals alive today, in this case, like lizards, monitor lizards um, specifically, in a bit of a different light than they did before. I would say that for me, it's in a professional sense, I want to do everything I can to help... Um, to help with the acquisition of knowledge of these animals and to help uh, preserve that knowledge for future generations. That as a fossil preparator, I've always um, summed up my, what my job description is, is uh, making data available for research. And I want to be able to do that for these incredible animals because without a fossil preparator, a lot of these guys, actually every single one of you 
couldn't be doing what you yeah. are doing. So yeah. I um, I want to keep uh, facilitating the incredible research or, uh, the incredible research that people like my esteemed colleagues and friends on here do. But um, more importantly, for uh, on a personal side, uh, I want to be to another generation of students uh, what my mentor Bill Sanders was to me. That uh, someone who could help people get into the field of paleontology, could help people through rough times in college, and would also just be like a, basically a, a mentor in every sense of the word. Um, I want to be the type of person that he would, that he would like literally lock us out of the prep lab when there was an art fair in town because one person mentioned that they hadn't been to it. And he was like, you're not allowed to come back until you've all had snow cones. Like get out of here. Fossils can wait, go live life for a bit. So I want to do that and help other people get into things. Tight. So, um, my desire, what is my desire? I wish to leave a salted blasted Heath behind me. <laughs> a work so thoroughly detailed and unassailable that no one dares touch it for a century. <laughs> um, that's slightly, you know, it's a little bit of a hyperbole. I think what I would like, the, the act of knowing something is, is reaching our grubby little hands back into like just eons of, of just nothing and pulling, pulling things screaming with our own blood, sweat, and tears into like a momentary consciousness that will then disappear, but is beautiful for it. And I would like to ensure that the parts of paleontology that I think are fundamental and essential, which is our, you know, a philosophy imparted to me by Jim Clark mostly, um, which is highly detailed anatomical work and thorough and as exhaustive as possible phylogenetic uh, influence remain the core of the field and are of a primary and renewed focus within the field um, that perhaps really, I don't, because paleontology, everyone's doing very interesting things, but it's the core of the field and it, it is the glamorous part. Like other hypotheses are fun, but this is the, this is the act of creating knowledge. The rest of it's modeling and like, you know, other stuff, but, that that's that is what fascinates and interests me. Yeah. What I entered the field thinking I wanted to do was solve the the squamate problem, as I tend to call it, which is that you know the, the phylogenies produced from molecules and morphology of lizards don't agree with one another, and trying to figure out what was going on with that, and that's still a, a something I'm investigating. It's part. It is the core of my dissertation. Um, but as I've spent the last five years working on this, I have come to realize that it was hubris to think that I could solve that problem, that this is, this is a problem that is going to be collaborative and years long. Um, the, the part now that I think I want to add the most to it is that what I, what I would love for people to take away from, from everything I say is that even if you want to assume blanket, assume that molecular phylogeny is correct, because you want to invoke a bunch of convergence in the morpho morphological tree. That's very possible. But let's not just invoke that and then be done with it. Let's actually look at what is convergent and maybe why and, and how and actually get into the nitty gritty beyond, beyond just being like, oh, dump it. Um, the, the dump it attitude I wish to, to destroy. Um, do you have a question, Alex? I just, if you're done, I had one more thing I wanted to add. Oh, no, I'm not, not quite. So like that's, Academically, that's what I'm still interested in pursuing is that kind of that vein of question and also looking at that those kind of like phylogenetic problems in the context of other groups of organisms. Um, but more important than that, as I've also come to realize over the like five years I've been doing my PhD is um, I don't really care anymore kind of where I end up or, or <laughs> what I'm specifically doing. I just want to be, I'd like to be remembered as someone who's like, when you talk about me in like a hundred years and like someone who's like seventies, like, Oh, I knew Dalton. Like to be like, Oh, he when was like one of the nicest people. Like years. be like, he was like a kind and good influence on the field. Like even if everything I've published is proven wrong, like, Oh, he was, they'd be like, Oh, he was an absolute idiot dunderhead who didn't know a premaxilla from a frontal who couldn't tell these lizards apart. But he was like, a pleasure to be around and was like a good, like something, some like I want my impact on the field to be like 
the field is better for me being in a part of it. So that's the legacy I want to leave. I would just add an addendum to my desires. I also wish to be maybe not known for, but to be recognized for a part in establishing kind of the next generation of collaborative international, like vertebrate paleontology, like, like, cause there's this, there's like a past generation of like people all around the globe that have worked very closely together. Shu, Mark, Alan, Jim, right. This, this kind of, this, this, cadre of great scientists and I would like to do my part in helping to kind of bridge disparate and you know exciting areas of research in that regard and and be part of that big group I would like to make one more addendum to my question if that's okay because I just thought of a better way to phrase it I share Alex's extreme emphasis on detailed anatomical work and like as information dense as possible phylogenetic systematics as the backbone of everything we do. But I think, I guess the way to summarize my general interest is if I could choose one thing, it is not necessarily that I reveal new information, but I change how people think about information in the field. Um, I think a lot of questions and a lot of uncertainties in paleontology are ones of interpretation where the raw data are available to us and it is a matter of understanding them in context. And, and that's hard. So I think that if I could choose one thing, it would be to be a person who looking back played a significant role in developing a framework that we can use to understand the information available to us in the fossil record, which is, and it's something that if you are a scientist and if you're a young scientist and you see historical specimens that have been studied, you will find things that have been missed and you will find things that you think were not interpreted correctly. Yep. And that doesn't mean that anybody who looked at it in the past was not good. It means that you're seeing it through a different lens of information. And what that means is that how we interpret that fossil evidence, which the fossil itself has not changed, the interpretation of it has changed. And I think that's a, I think that's a critical component. Yeah. But we're also all young. And what we think is valuable and important might change. Yes. I have a question for everybody. Yeah. Mercury Adamolos 3687, who will be called out at the end of this very long video because Mercury Adamolos is one of our um, Gorgosaurus tier patrons. Thank you. Woo. Thank, Thank you, you very Woo. much. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your support. Um, asks, what are some of the crew's hobbies? If you're too busy to have hobbies, what are some hobbies you used to have that you would like to pick up again when and if you have more time? Perceptive. Uh, Yeah, very perceptive. I'll start. um, Funny enough, one of my hobbies for a very long time in my life was video editing. Um, I I briefly had a period where I wanted to go to film school. And one of the main ways me and my friends would have fun is we'd shoot like videos with each other and then I'd edit them. So did a lot of special effects stuff and after effects. I learned premiere, did a lot of sound effects editing. And um, I guess fortunately one thing that kind of makes this channel really personally fulfilling is not only the amount of like success and support we have, but that it is a justification for me to spend some time doing that again, because that completely fell by the wayside when I was doing my PhD and I missed it a lot. I also have a basil plant. Those are good. That's a hobby. The singular plant. In in the same vein of things, like something that I used to do a lot um, that this channel has given me the opportunity to do again is, is artwork. I used to draw constantly. Like that was my plan A. That was actually the thing that my parents told me not to do as a, as a job, which again, <laughs> fair. It's the, which like, I'm sure they, they were, they were thrilled when I chose something with equally bad odds of getting a paying job in. Um, but anywho, yeah, so, like, that that's something I used to do a lot more of, and now this channel with, like, the skull drawings and the logo and everything else has given me some time to do go back to doing that. Um, and I also did a lot of writing in my free time, both poetry and short stories and that kind of thing. Cool. Cool. Um, and for me, uh, I really haven't given up any of my hobbies because, unlike these guys, I have a 9 to 5. So yeah. I have free time. Um <laughs> But uh, so I I love video games, movies, um, which I think is just kind of common for everybody who is here. But uh, I love cooking, going out in nature. Um, I also have a lot of plants and yeah, 
audiobooks, podcasts. All right. Um, nature. I used to bike, but I don't do too much anymore. Uh, aquatic activities, see snorkeling and paddleboarding. I'm into Legos, magic, uh, Call of Cthulhu, which I like to run campaigns for. We had a great uh, and terrible movies. Day. And don't any of you in the comments be like, oh, Sharknado? No. Someone has to try. It has to, it's supposed to be good. The intent is to and be good. Also cut I think that's all the core interests I have. You didn't mention oh, H.P. For- Lovecraft. Oh, I said Call of Cthulhu. Well, but yeah, yeah. Cosmic Horror. I, I devour short Cosmic Horror stories, not just Lovecraft, modern stuff too. Oh, I forgot one of mine. Uh, I love making cocktails. Yeah. Tight. Nice. Um, oh, Star Wars. I was gonna, I was going to say, I don't want to make a, an IP a hobby, but Star Wars is a hobby of mine. I want to know everything about Star Wars. Um, it is one of the most important things in my life, which is a sad thing to say, but here we are. Welcome to, welcome to Earth. That's all right. Um, no, uh, my hobbies, I love to sing. That's like the one hobby I really kind of haven't had to give up is singing. Um, I sing in an acapella group at Yale and I also sang in a band for a year before all the band members dispersed to various corners of the globe um, I used to read a lot of fiction which I don't have the chance to do as much anymore so after the PhD I'd like to do that um, again yeah, video games magic board games I really love board games of all kinds I'm the, the big proponent of we need to play more holotype uh, which you saw briefly on the stream I do. But, um, love board games and then I'd like to, once I have more free time, get into um, kind of like small scale model making. I watch YouTube videos of that all the time and I really, really want to do it. Um, Warhammer. Not quite Warhammer, but I mean, it's in the oeuvre of Warhammer. Uh, Okay. And then uh, I would also love to, um, wow, I'm blanking on the other thing that I really want to do with my life, which is (laughs) something that's good to know. Um, yeah, that pretty much sums it up. I, the other thing's not important if I can't think of it off the top of my head. So the next one is from Kevin Prem, who is also a patron. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, what are, are our favorite museums in the world, either for collections to study or just overall? Um, I will answer this one first. Oh, man, it's so hard. Um, they're all very cool. Uh, I'll give a two-parter, which is obviously the Milwaukee Public Museum is, like, formative for me, and I would say, like, my favorite museum. No contest. Um, But with respect to uh, museums to visit for studying or visiting their collections, I love the Sternberg Museum in Hayes, Kansas. Like, it's very small, but it's so well organized, and they have incredible fossils, and I just love it every time I have an excuse to go out there. Okay, I'll go now. Um, call me a New York loyalist. Um, call me a dirty Yankee, if you will. Um, the American Museum of Natural History is the is was essentially my second home growing up. It was my cradle. It was my incubator. And it it was my grave. it was my graduate school, and it will probably be my grave. Anyway, no. Yeah. no so you know, so the AM and H just it, it's just one of it's just my favorite um, favorite place on earth. Um, Doing a PhD is really stressful and difficult, and there were a lot of times where I was really upset and really stressed out and really tired. Um, but the thing that always kept me going was that every time I walked through the doors into the AMNH, I had a little little bit of that thrill that popped up, and I just um, it keeps you going. In terms of museums to work at, I want to give a very special note to the uh, Natural History Museum of Utah, which I've been working at a few times this year. And I have only ever had like exceptional experiences working in those collections. They're really, really a pleasure. Um, and so if anybody from the Natural History Museum of Utah is watching this, in fact, I suspect one volunteer is. Um, hi, Alex. We appreciate your support. Um, it, it's been a wonderful place to work, and I've really enjoyed. Um, you know, it's kind of a highlight of a lot of my trips. Tight. Scott. God, wouldn't it be fun if someone just like broke the mold and said like an art museum or something was their favorite museum? But uh, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's going to be the AMNH because it's the AMNH. It's like the best natural history museum in the world. Like, it, it, is there anything else that could compare to it? No, the answer is no. So it's the AMNH. I, I, right. I love the Michigan Museum. I love it a whole lot. It's not the AMNH. <laughs> 
Are we transitioning? Cool. All right. Um, it's the AIM and H. It's so, <laughs> so easily and clearly the AIM and H. Um, but I would like to shout out that I have been to a lot of museums that I thought were also very impressive. Uh, the Carnegie is great. Yeah. Carnegie is wonderful. Um, for both collections, back there since uh, stuff, too. and a fun visit. The displays are great. Yeah. And then uh, also Yale. I mean, that's a bias because most of my collection work is just I go to the basement and talk <laughs> to Marilyn Fox, who's super cool and nice. And Vanessa, who's also super cool and nice. Marilyn is also not dead, which is important to note after you <laughs> implied that she was at SVP. I did not imply she was dead at SVP. She asked me to use particular photos that made it look like in memoriam. <laughs> anyway, those are... Um, and honestly, that museum in Canada was pretty lit. Was that the Terrell? That was the, no, yeah. we were at the University of Alberta. Yes, um, sorry. But yeah, the Terrell is also amazing. Yeah, no, 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 for SVP. Yeah, that was the Terrell. Oh, that was the Terrell. Right, I'm sorry. I was yes. very impressed by their history of life hall. I thought that was fantastic. No. Oh, oh no, you're talking Terrell. about the University the of Toronto. The ROM, ROM, Royal Ontario. The ROM, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking I'm about SVP in Calgary. I'm sorry. Very cool museum. And honestly, the collections uh, in the uh, University of Vitsvetersand, they have a little museum, but they're also very good. Sorry, all right, that's a lot of answers. Oh, I'm done. Um, Hit me up. So for mine, I think the ultimate, the ultimate natural history museum that you can go to to see in terms of display, in terms of collection is the American Museum of Natural History. Like it just, it's like, I've, I, I visited there for the first time when I did my interview at Yale and I was completely floored. I had never seen, like, I love museums and I just had not seen anything like it. The way I pref I think I prefer the phylogenetic layout because I'm more phylogenetic minded. Um, but if you want to walk through time exhibit, which is the other best way to do a, a fossil hall, um, the Denver Museum, I'm a, it's a, I'm a local, I'm biased, is, is my museum. Like if I, could work at any museum, I'd probably choose that over the AMNH because it, I think so much of my life is owed to that institution. And it's great. They have a lot of really great displays. I think the layout of it is really conducive for like learning about different kind of subject groups as you're walking through. Um, I, I love the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Also, I'm gonna shout out a, a very small museum just outside of Denver that's really worthwhile to check out if you're into dinosaurs and you happen to be in the area, which is the Morrison Natural History Museum. It's in the town mm. of Morrison, Colorado, and it's kind of in this, like a two-story house. Um, but the amount of cool stuff they pack into that little house is pretty astonishing. Tight. Yeah. I, I think it's worth noting for the viewer that answering the question of like, what's your favorite or what's the best natural history museum is kind of like, what's the most powerful military in the world? Like, it's like you can start answering after the United States of America. Like, <laughs> like... Right. It, it's like we, we know it's one of them by so far that it could also beat like all of the next tier. Um, yeah. The AMNH is kind of in a league of its own. Um, Such humility. But I, I, but I think, well, I mean, listen, it's not like I built it or something. They accepted me as a student. <laughs> um, I think it's also worth noting, though, that ver every museum I've ever been to has gems in it that yes. make it worthwhile to go to. And that while the AMNH has a historical legacy and kind of financial backing that's made it the the scale and scope of what it is which is astonishing um small museums are also some of the best ones to go to and every museum of every size has things that are worth seeing mm -hmm. um yeah if i'm in a new city i go to the natural history museum it's just a rule yeah um and i always, always am happy i went but the aim and h also clears because it has the most cool dioramas of taxidermy animals which kick ass next question <laughs> yes um I, I will just very quickly say, if you do go to my little local museum of the University of Michigan one, uh, if you do go and see their exhibits, there's a good chance that I made those because uh, <laughs> I made a lot of the things that are on display there. So. That's rad. Go see Scott's hard work. New York. Absolutely. Next one would be at Emerson Huth, uh, 8034. Um, for each member of the skeleton crew, what's your pick for the weirdest prehistoric animal? Could be looks, adaptation, etc. Um, Tully monster, and it's no question. Good answer. Good answer. Good. Answer. We don't. We barely even know what it is. Right. Uh, it, it also it always it always blows my mind that it's way way younger than I always think of it. Mm. Uh, think of it like I always think it's one of those like um uh. Like car, uh, like Cambrian explosion, like Burgess Shale sort of critters, but like no, it's Pennsylvanian. Like it's weird. Okay, I, my answer: Eret Maripus, um, Eret Maripus Carol Dongai. It is a Hupasukian, 
Um, it is a it is a marine reptile. It's got oh. a gigantic it's got gigantic vertebrae for its body size. It's got these little paddle like limbs. The front flipper is way bigger than the back flipper, and it's got this tiny platypus like head that looks That's like it was copied on from the wrong. Like it looks like it was just copied on from something else. Wow, the holotype. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking at it on geez. Wikipedia right now. The holotype does not have the head. And so I think for a little while people were spared, and then we found the assigned specimen. <laughs> that is just God, Hoopasukians are so weird, man. Weird. Yeah, Hoopas like I this was exposed to me actually by a manual shop at in my Vert Paleo class at the AM and H. It was a new paper at the time. It was just like, look at this. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, do not show it to me. I like <laughs> I, do, I pretend I do not see it. On the Wikipedia page, it says, University of California Davis paleontologist uh, Ryosuke Motani told the New York Times that the animal's odd features initially stunned him. When I first saw it, I just said, what? And didn't speak for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, mean, right yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess I'm next. Um, ichthyosaurs. We don't know what they are, right? Like, we still have no idea. Kind of like they're reptiles, and that's like the extent of it. They kind of appear, and they're insane, and they're bizarre, and yeah. I don't like thinking about them too much because they're very, very weird, and we really don't know what they are. And yet, they were really like the original marine reptiles, the original marine amniotes, basically that really took off and were successful, and they were around for a really, really long time. So, yeah, it and that's funny because Hoopasukians are the fifth group. Right. Ew. So it's a it's it's a clade of freaks. <laughs> they so Hoopasukians still have way weirder though. Hoopasukians still have ectopterygoids and ichthyosaurs don't. Fun fact: <laughs> the most don't confident have description, uh, the most confident placement we have for Tully Monstrum is bilateria. <laughs> All right, I my get turn. That, but like, it's a little wiggly, man. And I can understand that. Not cursed fish monster that's giving live birth. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff. Like in terms of stuff where it's like. I know kind of what this animal is, but it's just bizarre and off-putting, like Vanclidia. But I mean, the, the correct, and I don't want to suggest that there's that my fellows have answered it incorrectly, but the correct answer is the uh, Ediacaran fauna. Because they're, gen like, we don't have, like... They're aliens. Are they animals? Yeah. Probably. Are they something else? Who knows? Where do they come from? Where do they go? <laughs> Are they related to the later clade? Like a, a, a deep, a deep mystery. Yeah, no, I, Ediacaran stuff's up there. I, I think they're the most unknowable of the prehistoric creatures or life forms, I should say, really. Um, in terms of weird things, I mean, like most of the Cambrian stuff's weird in, a, in an interesting way. Um, I think, and, and this, this may seem odd because they, they're not really that difficult to understand. Like, they're just kind of a weird fish. But, like, the heterostrakins for me, I think, are the weirdest creatures because they just look really, really stupid. And I have a hard time just imagining them. I, I, I know that they just swam around and did stupid things, but, like, I have a hard time imagining them being alive. That was the, uh, those were the fish that, when I was very young, convinced me that the biblical crea uh, account of creation was not complicated <laughs> enough to explain why they existed. All right. They're really stupid. They're great. I love. They're, they're so. Silly. They're really funny looking. They're great. An armored spiked tadpole. Scott, was that you? All right, it's my turn. All right. Yeah. All right, guys. I got. I got us. All right. Man, there are a lot of these. All right, we're gonna do. We're gonna do a quick one, Dalton. Okay. And this one kind of applies to both of us. Uh, so Jay uh, Bratsis, or however you say that, uh, asks. As Alex and Dalton are both attending Yale, I'm assuming you guys work together and see each other often in school. How come you guys aren't in the same room, sharing the same screen, uh, when you all post the React videos for JWE2? It's funny you ask uh, that. I'm going to give a very brief answer to this, um, and Dalton can fill in if he finds that this is unsatisfactory, uh, because that would suck. Um, <laughs> and often I find it as a good opportunity to do work uh, while we record videos in the lab and it's an excuse for me to stay to ungodly hours. I will elaborate on why it would suck. Not only do we work together and see each other often in school, we live together. We are roommates. Yes. Uh, the, the door behind you leads to a corridor in which there's my bedroom and then there's Alex's bedroom. 
many a time when we record the Jurassic World Evolution 2 videos, we technically are in the same room because Alex is on the couch in kind of the living room area, which shares just an open floor plan into this kind of like office area that we've set up with both of our desks. And I record on my desktop, which is at my desk. We try to avoid doing that as much as possible uh, because it is audio hell. Because when we're both recording with microphones that are like eight feet away from each other, there's a lot of echo and it sounds really bad. Um, so it's better if one of us is, is mobile and Alex is the mobile one. Um, and so often he will not be here. Uh, we could, I guess, in theory, record from one camera and microphone. But the other issue is that I man the gameplay for those videos. So he'd have to like sit next to me. And also, yeah. I just think that'd be even trickier to make look and sound good. So the answer is is more of a technical reason than anything else, um, because we do live together. Audience members, if you want a tiny peek behind the curtain, if you look at the the little stinger that we put at the end of the feather, uh, the Jurassic World Evolution 2 feather DLC trailer reaction that we did, uh, you can see... Dalton literally just lean over and yell at Alex in the other room, and it's <laughs> very funny. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Tight. I'm going Next to. Uh, let's see. We're gonna go with. No, I don't. I don't want to be the king of the multi-parters, so I'm gonna not do this one yet. I am going <laughs> to ask the question, and this is directed, not in the question, but I'm going to direct it at Amelia. It's from Matt Hedgern, um, who asks, there's some preamble that involves Sonic the Hedgehog, and that puts you on thin ice in my book. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, Matt asks, what was the thought process behind the Skeleton Crew logo, like the skulls and jumping back, the final color palette, having the text form a triceratops, etc.? And given, the Amelia, that you designed the logo, uh, I will f uh, direct this to you. Sure. Um, the backstory is that it became my hyperfixation while I had COVID the first time and I had nothing else to do and I was going insane. <laughs> As these guys all remember, I turned into hyperdrive doing this one thing and wanting to get it done. Um, well, we first had to decide on the name and I really don't remember how we came to this. Like we had a couple of it's things in the running for a while and somehow we agreed on this one and then we proceeded from there. Um, Scott told me about With a much logo animal, for yeah. something that never got used. That was the that was the idea of like text in the shape of a skull. And so I was thinking about that. It was when I was originally thinking of doing a YouTube channel by myself. Mm -hmm. That it was the logo I came up for for that that I never used because I never did anything. So I sent it to Amelia for some inspiration. Right. Yeah. So it was that. And I think obviously at this point we had come up with the name and I had just kind of, I have the sketchbook is over there. So the, the original logo is sitting over there on my desk still in that sketchbook. Cause I drew it by hand first. Cause I had just written the words out and I was looking at them and I'm like, what kind of shape is this? And I honestly have no idea how it came to me or what happened, but at some point the idea struck and I was like, oh my God, these letters do fit a shape. Cause I was like, what skull would make, would work with this? Cause that's conceptually kind of a good idea. And so that was the first step was the triceratops with the letters in it. And from there, there were several iterations of like, okay, it needs to be more than that. Cause there, there are five of us. I wanted to have like a piece of us in, in the design. Um, one of the initial ideas we had was like the like almost like the medical logo thing where there was the pickaxe in the middle behind the triceratops, I believe. Or no, the triceratops mm -hmm. was like above. And there was the pickaxe and we had a, mos a whole mosasaur silhouette and a whole lizard silhouette kind of spiraling around the pickaxe. And like a, it was initially it was a velociraptor skull. It wasn't Jungersuchus. Um, initially, that was a change that happened right. later. And it was so it was velociraptor and Gorgo, I believe. Um and we had not had a, pa a color palette at this point. The color palette was the last thing to happen. Um, and that was uh, just me kind of playing around on, there's a color palette picker website that Scott introduced me to. And so I was just sitting and clicking through and seeing what kind of came up. And as you may have noticed on our Redbubble, there was a lot of different color variations of the logo. And that's because I liked a lot of them. And so the ones that are uploaded there are like our final slate of ones that we all voted on. Um, that's why that perhaps their names don't make sense, because uh, that was my own way of keeping track of which color variant was which. And as these guys all remember, I was sending slates of like 15 different color var variations in Google Forms and be like, hello, everyone, which colors do you like? And we narrowed it down eventually and eventually 
And I think we landed on the one that we did just be, and which is called, I don't know if I have it on the red bubble, but it's called earth because that's kind of, it's like this earthy palette that I thought was really appropriate for, for paleo and for reptiles and things. Um, and the other kind of component okay. to picking the colors was how the logo looked on both black and white backgrounds. And this is one of the palettes in particular that works very well on either background. Doesn't matter what you put it on. Every element of it stands out. Um, yeah. Did I answer all the parts of that? I think you sure did. Yep. You okay, so great. And then like a really quick addendum to that was the, the pride logos came right away too. Cause I thought that was something important to represent and to have. Um, mm -hmm. And that was just, I Googled pride flags and I picked out the ones that like, a, I, I recognized I knew about, but also like the ones that had really nice palettes. Cause most of them do almost all of the flag pride flags I've seen have really, really nice palettes. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, COVID lockdown is 10 days. So I had a lot of time to play around in illustrator and change the colors <laughs> of the, of the logo. Okay, is it back to me? It's back to you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to cheat and ask two questions because one of them uh, we've already answered, which is another um, Wilhelm Tan 5301 asks, how did all four of us meet and what is our favorite discovery? Um, I'm going to ask for a brief because we, we need to do so many more questions. Um, we are. I'm going to just say a particular fossil that is my favorite discovery and then we can move right along. Sure. My favorite discovery is the nesting Cytopody. This is not just because I'm working on Cytopody. It's a cool fossil and an important one. I guess, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm up next. I'll, I'll stick within the theme of, of, of things that I work on that I think are cool. The, the freaking, that, the tail outline on the Mosasaur, the Moroccan prognathodon mm. that actually has the shark tail, like, holy shit. Like, not that I was in paleo when that happened, so I didn't get, like, the thrill of it. But when I found it on Google Scholar, I was like, wait a minute, we have that? Like, it's so, so cool. And I'm immediately breaking trend by going with something that I've never worked on and none of us have, um, but it's the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx. It's one of the most absolutely incredibly gorgeous fossils ever. One of arguably the most important fossils ever. Amazing. That's a good one. Yeah. I have it um, on my wall for a reason. I have it on my body for a reason. Oh yeah. Good point. I, I think the two fossils that have most captured my fascination uh the fighting protoceratops and velociraptor i think is one of the most dynamic and incredible fossils ever found um a shame that specimen is barely described <laughs> for, for the audience. um i also was just blown away with the anchiornis color stuff yeah i don't really work particularly closely one. on the latter but i think it's just really cool yeah I uh, I like the uh, I also like the fighting dinosaurs. That's possibly the most miraculous fossil ever preserved. Um, unbelievable that it also is an animal that a lot of people are interested in being Velociraptor, um, and interested in it not because of that fossil, but because of a movie. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, no, I think my favorite is Dinochirus. The the discovery of the body and the head of Dinochirus, not only because it's interesting as just an animal but just the story around it and kind of the long, the solving of a longstanding mystery, the the public and private interests involved. It's a cool story. We talk about it in our feathered dinosaur video and we'll talk about it more when we make a dedicated Dinochirus video someday. Um, but that's mine. So the next question is by, or from triple header, which is that if we were forced to switch paths from our current research to a new clade of animals, uh, different from the ones that we're currently working on, what would we pick and why? Um, this is a fun question for me and James, given that this is literally something they ask you during the interview at the, at the AM and H at least mm. they did for me. I don't know if they did for, for you. No, they, they did, did for, for me too. It's yes. Yeah, so it's why then it's one that I, I heard about um, from like all the others. So one of the questions they ask us is you cannot work on your study system. What do you do? Um, and they, you, uh, the, 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 the question asker says that they won't determine how broad or specific we will be. Uh, but the aim and H does. And I said something like, so I can't work on Mosasaurs. Can I work on lizards? And they're like, no, no reptiles. They, they really make you. It's, it's kind of to see how, if you get thrown by a question like that or not. Um, 
So while well, you specify animals, the answer I gave to the AM and H was I would pivot in the botany, get out of there. Um, if I had to work on a different group of animals, it'd probably be mammals. It would probably specifically be like saber tooth cats or hyenas or ungulates, because I really, really love things with horns and, and antlers and things. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely mammals, either something with big nasty teeth or big crazy uh, cranial ornamentations. This may be cheating for me because I actually have done work on a completely different group of animals that I'm uh, about to submit the paper on. We're just one final round of co-authors comments away. Um, but it's a answer, pretty... It doesn't count. Okay. Well, what I would say is if I had to switch my primary research interest, it would also be mammals. Um, however, my other choice that I think I could choose easily is also is just squamates in general. Um, I'm fascinated by lizards and snakes. I've never really done much formal research on them, but I think that they're really cool. And there was actually a point in my PhD when Mark Norell basically said, based on the questions you like, you should probably be working on lizards. And I said, okay, I'll try to solve the squamate problem. And then I learned Dalton was doing that. And I was like, well, I'll stick with theropods. Seems hard. <laughs> and so that's why I am where I am right now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, squamates are mammals. Scott. Hmm. If I was to choose to change my field of specific research to a different <laughs> clade than the ones that I research. Move on to Alex. He doesn't research. Mm. Cool. All right. That's easy. I, I go into exhibit design okay. or something cool. like that. I, I'm, I'm keeping it in the same vein. That's um, uh, but I, I, I find that really interesting. And the times I've worked in exhibit design and, and exhibiting and stuff, I've always thought was really cool. Okay, so if I were to work on other stuff, ooh, I'd say Eurypterids, but I technically currently work on Eurypterids. You just told um, me that doesn't count. Yeah, so it doesn't count. I'm trying to think it, bro. And I'm doing like basically all reptiles for the palate thing. You know what? I've decided some reptiles count. I would, so, I mean, talking theropod stuff now, but I, I would really like to dig into like Triassic Sauropterygians. Like the weird marine reptiles around of the time, I think, are fascinating. And need some. There's a ton of them, and I don't know how many people work on them. And each one is weird and cool. Cool. That's it. Yep. Sure. Yeah. And I'm I'm fortunate in a way in that my first love of paleontology isn't what I'm working on now. So I'm working on lizards right now, and I do love lizards. If I had to work on something else, I'd work on dinosaurs. Um, I am don't you technically technically are working cans. on theropods, so I'm going to say I would work on. Um, I'd work on ornithischians and probably like armored dinosaurs. Like I'd love to work on either thyreophorans or marginocephalians. I think they're really cool. Tight. All right. Last Scott, question. Right. Last, last question. Last question in this section. All right. So it's a multi-parter. We're gonna we're gonna rapid fire this. What's your favorite sauropod? Mine's a margosaurus. What's your guys? Barosaurus. Also a margosaurus for me. Patagotitan or Argentinosaurus. They they do the best thing sauropods do the best, which is big. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Alamosaurus, I think. Is in the same vein, big, kind of spiky. Makes sense. Also, this is from Jurassic Wine. Or, or Jurassic Swine. There we go. Good name. Um, oh, so thank God somebody said Alamosaurus, right? <laughs> oh, is this the Alamosaurus person? I actually I don't so. remember. I, don't I think, think so. Is. I don't know. Um, the, the second part of that question is what resources do you use for researching extinct life? And then um, also, I guess the other part on that is what, uh, what online resources would you recommend? In terms of the resources that we as paleontologists use, obviously there's the immediate physical resource of the fossil, right? That's your primary data point. But uh, in our work, we, we are big CT data heads. Mm-hmm. Um, so we use uh, micro CT scanners. We scan fossils, um, and we use that to in investigate and explore the anatomy, uh, dissection uh, of wet specimens, wet, to learn more about anatomy. Uh, even though they're extant, this informs the extinct stuff. Um, I guess what is a resource? The literature, I mean, like they're publicly available, like phylogenetic platforms too, uh, which are very important to our work. So things like TNT and hmm. East and Mr. Bayes and stuff like that, uh, which help us find phylogenetic trees, uh, as simply put as, as, as that can be. Anyone else have anything they want to throw in for resources? 
Yeah, well, mine. It's actually my answer to three. Maybe if that's if it's okay if okay. I go ahead no. and answer three. We, well, there's two things. Morphosaurus. God bless Morphosaurus. God bless Morphosaurus. Um, <laughs> Which is a website where CT data is uploaded, um, as well as many other kinds of data. Right. So, I, so if you're really trying to just learn something new about an extinct animal, quite honestly, Wikipedia yeah. is a great starting point. Um, the dinosaur and paleontology fandom, for lack of a better term, is really, really like hyper vigilant about reporting on new papers and adding them to Wikipedia articles. And so if I'm like really unfamiliar with something, I always start there and go to the literature cited therein. Um, the, I think that one of the underrated difficulties of entering a field is really beginning to engage with it like a professional. Mm -hmm. It's one of the kind of guiding principles of this channel, I think, is like we're trying to provide you a specialist focused view of what paleontology is like to us. Um, that's why there's sometimes a big difference from, with how we talk about things than how other paleo YouTubers might. And so I think that if you're interested in trying to learn more and like kind of learn to engage with the field the way we do, spending time in online spaces where we are around is good. And so like specifically if you're on paleontology Twitter or social media or something, like making sure you're following primarily the scientists and seeing how they interact with each other and how they talk about stuff is I think a really important thing if you're trying to like vet the quality of the literature. Yeah. Because like <laughs> often a paper will come out and paleontologists will say, that's stupid. We don't need to really think about that. But to people who aren't in the field who don't see that discussion, and there's probably good reason for it. They wouldn't just write it off as dumb, right? They'd discuss it and why it, why it might be incorrect. If you're not privy to those discussions, you see a scientific paper that does not have a published rebuttal, and you might say, this is current information. And so- Follow you know, Tom Holtz. Follow Tom Holtz yeah. is really what I'm going to get. He posts literally right? every yeah. paper. God bless him. Yeah. Tom Holtz is my Google Scholar alert. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need RSS feeds anymore when we have Twitter. Right, and when you have Tom Holtz's Twitter. Yeah. Um, can I piggyback briefly to, to, to kind of elaborate a little bit and, and give another resource? Um, so sure. I think in terms of resources, the most important resource that we use beyond the physical data, be it the actual fossil or CT data, is the literature, um, the scientific literature, which is like the primary reporting of scientists who are working on material. And that's very dense and it's hard to read if you're not used to it. And it takes a lot of time and energy to like get good at reading it and like no one's good at it to start the best thing to do is in in one respect to practice try to find and and the other thing is to like talk to authors right if something's can like if you have questions you can usually like contact the author via either email or social media and and get some kind of a response um if you're trying to read papers and you find you don't have access some papers are what we call open access which means anyone can like go to the website and read it for free many papers you have to pay to read never pay to read a paper there are several things you can do uh, the first one is if you're at like a school that has a library, use your VPN or go to like the school network. Oftentimes the school is subscribed to various journals. You can read it there. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, if you can't get access to a journal through an institution or something else, you can always email the authors and they'll be happy to send you a copy of the paper. hundred uh, percent. The right other thing here. to do. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Can I add one point? Yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. So journal papers are copyrighted and the journals do charge access to them, but authors of the of the articles retain the ability to send them to anybody. So it's not like you're circumventing the system yeah. if you ask the author for a copy. Like we are specifically yeah. given that right to share it as we please. Mm -hmm. And we will share it with anybody who asks. Yeah. Um, I delight and the other website that you could use cat. to try and find things is WorldCat. It's like a, a digital library, basically. And so that's another, like, if, if you are having trouble finding a PDF on your own, like, it usually doesn't find things that, like, Google Scholar can't find. Because I don't think any of us have actually said Google Scholar so far. Like, that is also, oh, yeah. like, point A. Go oh, to yeah. Google oh, Scholar yeah. and type in the thing that you want to know, and you might find papers about it. And it's, like, a, a start. And it'll automatically tell you which ones are freely available and give you the link to them. Um, and if Google, Google Scholar fails yeah. you, you can try WorldCat. Usually it doesn't. Like usually Google Scholar is using WorldCat or like another website repository like that to find the PDFs. Um, but it's it's worth a shot. And and with WorldCat too, you can actually request like interlibrary loans. If you are at a school, you can request physical copies or PDFs or whatever. You can even request that a museum or a library scans their old paper that they have. So this is actually the case yeah. for a lot of like the really old paleo papers. Like they have them physically and just no one has needed to see them before. But if you just ask them like, Hey, can you scan that for me? Like they do no problem. And I believe it's the Smithsonian right. has a really good 
online database of like these yeah. really old papers that don't always show up in the search. Um, so the yeah. AIM and H does too. It's not as good, but it's it's not bad. Yeah, yeah. lots of resources. Uh, yeah, cool. Lots of resources. So I think we should move on. Yeah. Uh, this is a question from Bua Bua sixty seven oh six, which I will read after I turn it a different color because my particular kind of neurosis would like this to be a different color. Thank you. Hi, hey, skeleton crew. I'm in high school and I'm, I'm aspiring to go into uh, the field of paleontology. The issue is I'm not sure where I go from here to pursue uh, the career. What should I do? Well, so uh, Alex, I'm sorry if you want to answer this, but I have, no, go ahead. I have a general statement. One is that we get a lot of questions about how to become a paleontologist. I get DM them on Instagram and Twitter, as well as like in the, in the channel, like a lot of people want to get emailed a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. right. And so I think that we are going to make a dedicated video about this because it, this is not something we want to bury in a Q and a session. Um, we will answer your question very briefly right now. We're going to stay true to our word, but we'll be producing something that's far more informative and far more detailed. We just don't have time to get into it like this. Um, a step-by-step -step guide almost. Right. My answer would be just double major in geology and biology. Yeah. <laughs> My answer is don't do that. Pretty much. Decide what you're interested in because I didn't do that and I would never want to study geology because I don't use it for my own questions and I don't care about it to much capacity. Amelia is incorrect. This hurts my heart. Geology is very cool. I'm sorry. Geology. It is really cool. Like, okay, let me be clear. Yeah. I don't actually mean that, but like, I am glad that I didn't kill myself in undergrad doing a second degree that I don't use right now. Like, if those are your interests, you do it, but it's not necessary. Especially if you know right. what you're doing. Or choose one as a major and one as a minor. I, yeah. What I'm yeah. going to amend my statement to be is if you don't know what your research interest is, like do both or like tr both. do a dual, double major or do an emphasis. You don't have, but I mean, a lot of people aren't going to figure out a research interest at that point. I yeah. didn't figure out, I thought I wanted to be a geology focused paleontologist until I was in graduate school. I'm like, going to say if you, oh, sorry. I'm just saying, I think that those are the two constituent fields that make up paleontology. I would I would give yes. both of them a try, and I would probably advise double majoring if you don't know which one you want your emphasis to be. Mm -hmm. I would say even if you think you know what your research question is going to be, double major anyway, because we were all stupid coming out of high school, and we understood nothing. All of us. The, the cruel, cold, like, knife edge of mineralogy beat the stupid naivety out of me <laughs> and made me a better person. Anyway, um, I'll just, uh, I'll add, kind of, you tore me a new one. I'll add a little bit just for, I get for, for clarification to what I said, but also something that I feel is very important. It is just as important to know what you don't like is to know what you like. So like try mm -hmm. both things, try different things, but if you don't like it, it's okay. Like as, as I've said several times, I think in other videos and obviously now, I have no formal experience in geology. Like I've read about it. I've enjoyed it just kind of tangentially, but I know enough. I know enough about myself to know that that is not a, a research interest that I have. It's not something that I wanted to pursue. Um, and that's okay. Uh, but trying things is important for figuring out what you don't like and what you like. And knowing that about yourself is good because as we will get to, when we eventually talk more about this field and this career, like it, it is a lot. It eats you alive. You need to love it to do it because it will test you every single day. Yes. In addition to the double major thing, just a few more handy, uh, helpful things for aspiring paleontologists. One, you can do this field. It's not, it's, it's a, it is within almost certainly within your grasp Two, take a writing class. If you discover you don't like to write, you're not going to like <laughs> academia. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a dig. Like I, I often find writing rather tedious, but like you're going to do a lot of it and you're going to need to get good at it and enjoy it kind of, or you're going to hate what you do. Three, um, master's programs. You don't need one. I did one. I really benefited from one. Other people don't. They go straight to the PhD. It gives you a leg up, but also it is a, it is an issue of sometimes funds uh, and time. And people have lives after undergraduate. So you don't, 
you don't need one, but they do help. But you don't need them. Also, take a stats class. Yeah. Take and a lot of stats don't, classes. Don't always be someone really to do stats like for you. If, if your professor yeah. only wants to teach you stats through sports analogies and you find that boring and tedious, just drop it and take it again with someone who you'll actually enjoy because you want to know this. Another, another piece of advice. Um, annoy faculty. Annoy paleo people. It'll just insert yourself into their life. Yeah, like when you show up at your undergrad, just be like, hi, uh, this is who I am. And everyone will be like, this person is annoying at first, but they will come to appreciate your enthusiasm and presence and passion. And a fantastic way to do that, if we want to just nicely segue into another one of the questions. Never. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's, Let's, do it. Do it. No. Let's do it. It would be uh, the question from Coulter Hall 2172, which is a question for Scott. How do you become a fossil preparator? Because what I would say is a fantastic way to annoy faculty. <laughs> and, but a fa- fantastic way to talk uh, to get your foot in the door and talk with faculty and get your name known by the people at your institution is volunteer in your fossil prep lab um, at your local institution. Uh, and uh, it's not a great way to annoy faculty. I've never annoyed faculty in my entire life. Uh, <laughs> All of them, all of them will uh, will say so in the comment section if I have, and if they haven't, I've never done it. So, um, uh, but in to genuinely answer the question, uh, which also continues with, I'd like to know the best way to get experience, any background or education I might absolutely need. Uh, what are the career prospects like? Uh, basically, any insights that can be much appreciated. Uh, so I'm going to very frankly start this out with, I am so sorry. I have incredibly bad news for you on almost every one of those fronts, <laughs> um, with the exception of one, uh, which is you don't need anything specific to be a fossil preparator. You don't need uh, you don't need a specific degree. You don't need a specific concentration in any degree. Hell, uh, uh, James and Amelia talked earlier about that they got asked during their interview process of, oh, if you could study a different uh, uh, study system than the ones that you're actually interested in, what would they be? Uh, I got asked the question, Scott, if you wanted to be a fossil preparator, why did you even bother to get a degree? <laughs> um, thank you, John Flynn. That one <laughs> threw me on my ass. But um <laughs> But it also is it is kind of a very genuine question. Fossil prep is one of the few fields in academia that I know of that basically you get into it through an apprenticeship. Like the reason why I got a job at the AMNH isn't that like, oh, I had an undergrad degree from the University of Michigan. I majored in all these things. It was that I had I was 24 years old and I had a decade of experience in one of the best fossil prep labs in the U.S. So crash. it was just like. Uh, holy shit, we need to actually talk to this kid. Um, so, like, some of the best fossil preparators I've ever met have not had, like, formal backgrounds in paleontology. Amy Davidson at the American Museum of Natural History is a fantastic example of it. Uh, she was a sculptor by trade before she started working in fossil prep. And those skills are very easily transferable. I, I uh, When you ask about any other advice to give uh be broad um you are everything from uh an anatomist to a sedimentologist to a material scientist to a chemist to a physicist to an engineer uh and you need to have your toes in every single one of those i I always joke that the and technician part of my title does a whole lot of heavy lifting um and yeah, basically anything that you could think that has to do with any sort of hands-on work with fossils, any sort of the different processes that go into that, whether that's mechanical, um, physical, um, digital, or chemical prep techniques, going out in the field and stuff, getting comfortable out there, all of that is incredibly important. But all of that is to say, and to uh, shoot it down with the last two things of how do you get that experience and what are the prospects like? The incredibly unfortunate uh, true answer to both of those is that almost in every situation, the way that you get an experience is volunteering, which I know is incredibly impractical for so many people. It's asking you to work for free. Um, I wouldn't wish that upon people. Uh, I did it for 
four years, uh, but I was uh, a high school student and I didn't have anything else to do. Um, but I also, I came from a family that was wealthy enough that I could afford to do that. And it's one of the big things that I want to try to change going forward in the lab that I operate um, to help bring people in and actually get them paid for uh, these positions. But I, hey, Harvard already has the policy that we're not allowed to have unpaid volunteers. So working on that. But um, and then to ask the prospects. Boy, it's rough. Uh, I, I'll put it this way. Uh, when I lost my job at the AMNH, when I got laid off, I genuinely thought that was it. That was my one chance. I had an opportunity to work in the field that I love and it got taken away from me by a pandemic and I will never, ever, ever be able to do that again. I'm, I'm going to be a janitor or a bartender somewhere that every once in a while, someone's going to call me over and just be like, Hey Scott, Scott, this guy, this guy watched the new Jurassic world movie. You used to like dinosaurs, right? And that that was just going to be my life. Um, but I got very fortunate and had um, the, the, uh the mcz at harvard have a job opening at the perfect opportunity and i was able to jump on that and get that to piggyback off that slightly like to to kind of get at what scott's saying like it with respect to prospects it is so much right person right time right place like so it's not to say that if if you're not able to get a position or a job or whatever, it's not that you failed. It's not that you're not qualified. It's not that it's none of that, which is a really hard thing yes. to internalize. Like knowing, obviously having a lot of friends in the field who have gone through this process, it is, there are just so ridiculously few jobs and so many people who want them that it boils down to luck, right time, right place, right person. I guess to sum up, right. Scott, your take on fossil prep would be, um, best way to get experience is volunteering. You probably don't need a formal education in it, but unfortunately the prospects are pretty rough and just in the terms prospects, of number of opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great job. Uh, and it's also one that, um, uh, on the topic of prospects, it's a job that people tend to hold on to. Um, there are so many people who are working in fossil prep, who've been working at the same lab that they are working in for like 30, 40, 50 years. So it's not something where there's generally a lot of turnover. Yes, Alex. Um, one very quick last thing I'd like to add, especially for people coming out of high school, um, is that no one you work under, like, is a good enough paleontologist that they can make you hate the field. Like, if, if someone is cruel or a bully or abusive, it's not worth sticking around with yeah. them. Get out. There are other people you can work with. It might be farther down the road, but like, it's not, it's, it's not worth suffering over, man. Right. I won't go into details, but um, I have been a victim of academic bullying and it is something that can completely derail you and nearly push me out of the field and has had reverberations throughout my life ever since it happened. Um, if you find you're in that kind of a circumstance, get out. Mm -hmm. There will be more opportunities. You might have to do yeah, something. Yeah, you don't follow that person. Right. Um, and but I'll I'll leave it at that. Can I also just add one very 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 last little thing on there? Just a last sentence, uh, because I I feel like I'd, I'd be remiss to not say this. But like, it is worth going into into fossil prep. It is my favorite thing I have ever done. If you want to, if you are one of those people that starts working in a fossil prep lab and it, it the bug bites you like it did me and so many other people, stick at it. We need people, especially with a lot of these people who are have been in the field for a while. A lot of places are really worried about brain drain. That's why I got hired on at the AM and H. That like our next youngest fossil preparator was fifty five. Hey Vern, how's it going? Um, so a lot of people, a lot of institutions want to have younger fossil preparators working there. So uh, uh, while uh, while that is an, an uncharacteristically bleak outlook, especially from me, especially from the people who know me, it is worth it. And I love this field. Yeah, I think it's worth saying we all love what we do. We're just, yeah. yeah. Eva Maria Garcia Garrido, 6123, asks, what's the most important advice you would give to someone who'd like to study paleontology? And I would say that it's, we, I don't know that there's like one piece of advice that is the most important. I don't want to cop out on answering your question 
Um, but suffice it, like everything we're saying in this section of the video, I think we all think is important advice. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think my advice would be kind of what we said earlier, but most important is like, try everything, like try as much as you can that you have the opportunities to try to make sure that it's something that you really enjoy, um, because you, you really do need to enjoy it. Um, I think that would maybe be what I think is the most important piece of advice, but it's hard to quantify that, but we can go around if people want to. Is it okay if I give a three-parter piece of advice? It's sure. three. It's okay. very short, I promise. Go ahead. Right. Open every drawer, turn every page, and question everything. Wow. <laughs> I was just going to say, my all I, all I would say is to closely echo Dalton. So, like, Jimbo's advice is very good if you're, like, in it and you're, like, trying to excel. But I think the most fundamental aspect is make sure it, like, excites you and interests you. And, like, when you see something, you're, like, when you're actually in the work, like, it's, you know, to read headlines and see art is fun. But like once you get into it and like you are working on your first project and if you are like, I f hate this, that that's not for you and that's all right. I, I, there are a lot of things we're all enthusiastic about that we don't pursue academically. Yeah. I would also, um, I'd like to jump on that yeah. a little bit, which is that if you start working on it and you're like, I love this and you get to a point while you're working on it, you're like that I hate this. That is a bit of a part of the process. Like there are projects that I'm working on and sure. I'm so yeah. tired of seeing them. I'm like, I hate this project. It doesn't mean that like I hate the field. Like I can still gut check and say I'm still enthusiastic about the broad scope of things. Right. So if you're in the weeds and you're feeling down, don't think that that's like I got to get out. But if you start and yeah, you're like, you... oh man, this sucks, that's maybe a good sign that you're like this maybe isn't actually for me. I'd say if you finish a project and all you feel is just relief that you don't have like it's just thank God it's done and like then kind of like God what's the next thing. Like once you finish something, you should there should be like a I will go right for the self-promotion. Wackman23 says, my question is, where can I learn more about Dromiosaurus specifically? Are there any books or articles you would recommend reading? And will you be doing a video covering them at some point? They're my absolute favorite dinosaurs, and I'd like to learn more about them. By the way, I really enjoyed the video covering JWE2's Thanks. Velociraptor. So first of all, thank you, Wackman. That was one of our first major videos, and uh, I'm still very proud of it. I think it's one of our best ones. Um, um, to learn more about Dromaeosaurs in particular, read my <laughs> papers. And read Alex's papers. Right. Um, most of them are actually both of our papers, so you can double dip a little bit with that. Okay, guys, um, we've reached the witching hour, which means that we are going, we are having constant failures of a recording platform to keep recording. And because of that, and because also we're all very tired and would like to play video games if we still have no. any energy left, we're going to break this video into two. Um, so we're going to answer one more question. Um, I'm going to, we're gonna, well, we're going to answer two more questions because I got interrupted by the program crashing in the middle of me talking about Dromaeosaurs. And then um, we're going to cut it there and we're going to get to all of the rest of the questions in the next video, which will come out um, as soon as we're able to make it, which our schedules are a little complicated right now. So it may take us a little bit of time, so, but bear with us. We will answer all of the questions. Um, okay. So dromaeosaurs, where to learn about them? Quite frankly, there's not a lot of great popular books that are like kind of current on dromaeosaur science. Um, most of the recent stuff has not really penetrated the non-specialist literature. Um, so I would say that if you are trying to start engaging with the literature and develop reading scientific papers as a skill, Dalton mentioned earlier that that's something that's often quite hard and something you need to learn. Um, I think reading papers on Dromaeosaurs is a good place to start. Um, that said, not to plug the skeleton crew too hard, but me and Alex have some really exciting work on Dromaeosaurs coming out soon that I think will be really, I hope will be very important papers in that realm. I certainly think they'll get a lot of attention. Um, but also we will be doing videos covering dromaeosaurs in particular. You know, we've alluded to, to plug the skeleton crew incredibly hard. Absolutely watch our stuff. Right. It'll be the best. It will be the best. Um, conssume. consume our media. So Dalton mentioned a little bit ago is. that, um, or what may have been four or five hours ago, who really keeps track of these things, right? It's a flat circle and I'm just going around like a, you know, I'm just accelerating each run. Um, ooh, big thunder. I 
we we've alluded to a couple times that uh, we'll be making videos about particular dinosaurs. Dalton mentioned a Dino Kairos video that is in the works. Um, so we're, you know, we are planning to branch out a little bit. We don't want to just do Jurassic World Evolution 2 for our stuff. We're going to keep that series going, but we want to branch out. And videos about Dromaeosaurid dinosaurs are absolutely on the docket because um, two of the world's young leading specialists on Dromaeosaurids are part of this channel. Um, and the other couple of them are friends of ours. So we, we you know... We got pretty much all of them. Uh, so so watch our stuff, read papers. Um, and if you have questions about stuff in the meantime, you can always ask <laughs> us in the comment section or a DM or something like that. We are always ready to talk. All right. So I've got the honor of reading the last question of this this part of the, the video, which is by HL Humbert 8481. Are there paleo jobs which don't require spending a lot of time in bigger cities? Asking as an introvert who has trouble decompressing in urban settings. Um, as, as the guys alluded to, this is a good question uh, for me in particular, given that I, I come from a city, but not a large city. Um, and I moved to New York City, which is the end all be all of humanity. Um, and <laughs> I, I guess in short, like there's plenty of paleo jobs that are actually the complete opposite of this. Um, there, there are a lot of like small museums out west um, that usually have internship opportunities, volunteer opportunities, prep opportunities, all of that kind of jazz. Um, the, the catch is finding them because they are tiny and often don't have social media presences. Um, one, I guess one, an example of one that actually does have a, a pretty good, I guess two of them that do have pretty good social media presences are the Ekalaka uh, Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana and the Sternberg Museum in Hayes, Kansas. Um, both uh, very good small museums in small, quiet towns with a lot of good opportunity for outreach education um, and experience and that kind of thing. Um, the catch, of course, to that is living in, in the West, which is effectively the middle of nowhere. Like, I say that endearingly. I love the West. I love being in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it's a logistical challenge to, to live out there and provide for yourself and all of that. Um, but, um, yeah, like there, it, it is certainly possible. And there's a lot of small, small schools that have, have paleo programs, or even again, as we talked about a little bit earlier, biology and or geology programs, like you don't have to go to a school that specializes in paleontology. Um, the important thing is that you're learning the science itself and that you're applying that science to what you want to do in paleontology. Um, and again, case in point, I, my undergrad program was in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is not a very big place. Like, Things are happening. I would say that it is a city, but it is not, it doesn't have a, an airport or, you know, or like, you know, like a commuter airport, or not a commuter, commercial airport. Um, but there's a paleo program there. And that's, you know, what I, what I did. And there's plenty of small schools like that. The trick is finding them, which can be a little hard given that the nature of small towns and the nature of small institutions is that they often don't have quite a big footprint online. Um, but if you, if you poke around, and you Google the right questions, you can you can find them. It is absolutely not necessarily uh, to live in a big city to do this job. Can I can I add something to what Please. Amelia said? Because there's just one one kind of realm that I think um, I think Amelia talked like really really um, well. Amelia did a wonderful job of talking Amelia about the outcomes in small places, like kind of in like small towns. Amelia talks great. Thank you. I've been talking. Um, but the, I guess the one gap in there, <laughs> um, the one the one thing that I I don't think that she addressed that I just wanted to mention as a possibility is um, if you're somebody who wants to live more in like a kind of suburban, I guess like just kind of normal American place that's not like necessarily a tiny town or not necessarily a huge city. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York. Um, that's a very creative place to grow up. Um, a lot of a lot of people are, live in those areas, but I like, I kind of live, you know, it's not like I like where I grew up. It's home for me, but it's just, it's kind of just a stretch of burbs. Um, but nearby where I lived and that allowed me to volunteer there was Stony Brook university. Um, and my first lab that I worked in was with Alan Turner at Stony Brook. I went in, uh, in summers between college semesters and did work in his lab. And I was able to do that because it was just something local to the suburban environment I lived in. I spent a lot of my early life going into the AM and H, but at that point in my life, it would have been hard to volunteer somewhere two hours away. Um, so 
I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of colleges and medical schools and dental schools and all of these places that tend to employ paleontologists that are not necessarily in huge cities, not necessarily in tiny towns, but just in the kind of American quilt of suburbia that you know spans so much of the country. And if that's the kind of place you like to live, there are also opportunities right. there. Um, so you can kind of do it anywhere you and want. And a lot of them are... And a lot of them are tied to universities. Right. I mean, that's the thing, right? Most of them are tied to universities. All right, guys, I'm going to do a yeah. wrap up because I am tired. Um, yeah. So, guys, that is it for part one of our Q&A for 5K. Um, I think, as always with the Skeleton Crew, we bit off slightly more than we could chew. And it took us almost four hours to get through the questions that we've done right now. And that'll probably be not too far off from the runtime of the Jesus video. Jesus Christ. So, um, we're gonna have to break it into two. <laughs> I know, right? So we're gonna we're gonna break it into two. Um, I hope you all understand that. You probably don't want to watch an eight-hour skeleton crew video anyway. Although maybe you do, they, and if you do, that's great for us. But you'll watch the other four hours, hours at a later on date. The live stream. I can see the reflection. Yeah. The, all right. I'm lying. You guys want to see us for as long as you possibly we're can, and I'm sorry that our our our, our spirit <laughs> is giving out before our bodies. Cool. Um, the body is the body is weak. Yeah, the, the, mind the is weak. spirit is willing. Yeah, well, yeah. Everything is just goo. I'm gonna turn my head, and just my brain is gonna slop out through my ear canal. Um. So anyway, guys, thank you as always for your support of the channel. Before we sign off, we want to briefly call out the names of our super generous Gorgosaurus and higher tier patrons on Patreon, who include Benjamin Sipser or Seepser. Um, please tell us how your name last name is pronounced so that we always say it right. We want to do you that bare minimum of respect. Um, Philip Fico, Florida Man, Riley Shero, and Wheat are five most generous donors. Um, we want to also thank all of our Patreon donors who are whose names are scrolling in the credits right now. And as always, we thank you all so much for your support. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe because it helps us grow the channel and helps us do more of what we really enjoy and what you guys really enjoy. So we all win. Please do it. All right, guys. This is the Skeleton Crew. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a beautiful time.